So the point for alcohols is that certainly under these conditions, at high temperatures, low pressures, unimolecular elimination to form an olefin and water is important. And this occurs also for ethanol and larger, hard, or larger alcohols also in this regime. So this was in shock tube ignition delay time experiments. Okay? So what about ethers? Okay? So ethers are similar in structure. So, you know, you've got, instead, you've got a, a radical, sorry, an alkyl functional group bonded to an oxygen. And instead of the oxygen then being bonded to a hydrogen, is bonded to another alkyl functional group. So they're, they're similar in that way. And actually, then, some of the reactions that are relevant are also similar. So let's look at them. Uh, to, let, let's just understand this, this plot first. So again, this is actually a, a plot from a, a paper by Kenji Yasunaga in, published in Combustion and Flame in 2011. And what he did was, he measured ignition delay times for a 1% hydrogen, 1% oxygen mixture in argon. So what's that, phi is equal to, point, um, phi is equal to 2? Is that right? No, phi is equal to 0.5, right? Uh, H2 plus a half O2, okay, gives H2O. Okay, so phi is equal to 0.5. And 98% argon, so highly diluted in argon. And what he, he measured the ignition delay times here as a function of inverse temperature. Um, and these are the solid um, bullet points here. And the, the pressures range from 1.4 to 2.6 atmospheres. And then he did some uh, interesting things. He took 0.1% of replaced some of the fuel. So we have 0.9% uh, fuel hydrogen still. And then 0.1% of each one of these um, fuels in turn, okay? So in other words, 90% 90, 90 of the fuel component was still hydrogen and then 10% isobutene in the first set of experiments, 10% MTB in the second, second set and so on. And what he saw was that the data were sort of divided in two, right? So when he added isobutene or MTBE or ETBE, he saw that all the ignition delay times were clustered here around the same point, and that they were all much slower in reactivity in comparison to the baseline hydrogen-oxygen ignition delay times, okay? Whereas if he added diethyl ether or ethyl methyl ether, what he found was there was some decrease in reactivity, not a lot, but some decrease at lower temperature, and even an increase at higher temperature in comparison to the baseline hydrogen-oxygen case, okay? So there's something, again, and, and I, I, if you see, here's ethyl terp butyl ether, methyl terp butyl ether, and then isobutene. So these were all the same, so these are behaving, these ethers are behaving like isobutene. And again, if we look at the chemistry, we see methyl terp butyl ether or ethyl terp butyl ether through this four-centered elimination reaction again, okay? can lead to the formation of isobutene and methanol in the case of MTBE, or isobutene and ethanol in the case of ETBE. So these ethers, under these conditions, similar to the condition of the alcohols that I showed you previously, are undergoing these molecular elimination reactions through a four-centered transition state ring, leading to the formation of an olefin, and in this case, an alcohol rather than um, water, okay? Because you have the functional group, okay? In this case, it's MTBE, so it's methanol, ETBE, ethanol, and so on, okay? But the reaction is almost, it's, it's the same type as in the case of the alcohol, right? And the ray constants are similar. So, but here now, the activation energy barrier, if you remember for the alcohols, was about 67 kilocalories per mole. Here, it's 60, about 60 kilocalories per mole. And these activation energies were calculated at ab initio level uh, using uh, this level of theory, okay? And these are the rate constants that were calculated for it, for the reactions, okay? But they're, they're, 
virtually identical. The activation energy here only differs by uh, 200 calories. So it's very, very, very similar. Okay. Now, if we look at ETBE, though, we, we also have a four-centered uh, elimination reaction, which can lead to the formation of uh, terbutanol and ethylene. So instead of getting isobutene and ethanol, we can also get terbutanol, terbutanol and ethylene. But the rate constant calculated for that reaction at the same level of theory was 5 times 10 to the 13 and 63.4. So the, the, the reaction of ETBE forming isobutene and ethanol, the rate constant was 1.7 times 10 to the 14. So that was five times, sorry, uh, three times faster in frequency factor. And also the activation energy was 60.6 or 60.8 kilocalories per mole. This is 63.4. So the activation energy was lower. The frequency factor was higher. So overall, the rate constant is going to be faster generating um, isobutene and ethanol than it is terbutanol and ethylene. So I think if you look at the branching ratio then of uh, ETBE decomposition, either giving you isobutene and ethanol or terbutanol and ethylene, it gives you about 90% isobutene and ethanol, and 10% terbutanol and ethylene, okay? Uh, depending, I suppose, on what temperature you're at. Okay, but if you look at ETBE, ethyl, terp, ethyl methyl ether, ethyl methyl ether leads to the formation of ethylene and methanol, or diethyl ether will give you also ethylene and ethanol, okay? And the rate constant calculated for both of these reactions, similar again, it's five times 10 to the 13 and 65.2 calories per mole, okay? So the rate constant is lower than it was for the formation of isobutene and, et and methanol and ethanol in the case of MTBE and ETBE, but, and, um, but we're getting, so you would think maybe that the reactivity of these fuels, ethyl methyl ether and diethyl ether, should be then maybe possibly lower than those, but they, they were obviously faster. If we go back, you see here's diethyl ether and ethyl methyl ether. It's faster. So it must stem from the products that are formed and not from the rate constant that you're using. Okay? So the rate constant will tell you just how fast the reaction occurs. But the overall reactivity is stemming from something else, which must be then the product species produced. Okay? So if you look again, isobutene, MTBE, and ETBE are all giving the same. So it must be then that MTBE and ETBE are giving, generating isobutene. And of course, isobutene will undergo oxidation, generating the methyl allyl radical, which is resonantly stabilized, and that will then reduce reactivity subsequently. And so the production of isobutene leads to much lower reactivity. In the case of ethyl methyl ether and diethyl ether, we produce ethylene. And ethylene is much more reactive. And even at higher temperatures, even leads to more reactivity than hydrogen. One thing I then asked, and this is an old slide, I'd, I need to update this based on the chemistry that we've, uh, we now have in our mechanisms. Okay, but this is an older slide, but it gets the point across. Okay, and if we look, this is just taking 1% fuel at phi is equal to one. And this is for temperatures ranging from 1,100 to 1,700 Kelvin. And if I just do this on the board, so if we take ethylene, we have C2H4 plus, is it 3O2? gives 2CO2 plus 2H2O. I think that's balanced, okay? And then we have C3H6 plus 4.5O2 gives 3CO2 plus uh, 3H2O. Okay, and then we have I C4H8 plus 6O2 gives 
four CO two plus four H two O. And finally, then, well, or we have C three H eight plus five O two gives three CO two plus four H two. Again, and then H ten plus five and four nine four <coughs> the six and a half, sorry. Am I right? I hope I haven't made an error in any of those. I think they're, they're correct. Okay, so if you look at the balanced equations in all of these, in all of these calculations, so we have 1% fuel. Okay, so 1% fuel. But if it's stoichiometric, then for ethylene, we have three O2s. For propene, we have four and a half. Isobutene, six. And for uh, butane, six and a half. Okay, so. If we think about the most important reaction in combustion at these conditions, with, which is relevant, okay, this is phi to one, and the pressure is one atmosphere, I should say. Okay, it's not written on the slide, but the pressure is one atmosphere. So if you look at the most, we have H plus O2 gives O plus OH. And for all of these, systems then, what's limiting reactivity is the, the concentration of H atom and or the concentration of O2, okay? But just based on stoichiometric coefficient and you'd expect the reactivity then of something like isobutene to be fast, twice as fast as ethylene just based on the sociometric coefficient, because there's twice as much oxygen in there. So the rate is depending on the rate constant times the concentration of H atom times the concentration of O2. So in the case of isobutene, the concentration of O2 is six. In ethylene, it's three. Yet, look at the reactivity of ethylene in comparison to isobutene. Isobutene is the slowest here. Ethylene is the fastest at higher temperature. And as I said, these are old, um, old calculations, but it gets the point across, right? So ethylene must be producing then much more H atom than isobutene, okay? And it is. So ethylene leads to the formation of vinyl radicals, and then vinyl radicals undergo oxidation, reacting, reaction with O2, and uh, giving uh, formaldehyde and formal radical at high temperature, and then formal radical gives H atoms, and formaldehyde leads to the formation of formal, which gives you H atoms, okay? So you get lots of H atoms through that process, okay, uh, from vinyl plus O2. And actually, you can see ethylene is even re more reactive than ethane, okay? So ethylene is very fast to ignite is really the point. And fuels that generate ethylene in, as a product during their oxidation tend to be fast to ignite. Okay. And then this is just showing you again that slide and reminding you about the relative reacti reactivity of the fuels and the production of H atoms. I spoke about that the other day. There's no point in going into it again. But that's, it's the same argument, okay? Uh, I've showed you this th this morning, and the point of this slide is just to re-emphasize that for low temperature chemistry, we can still consider the same elementary reactions, types, and so on. Okay, the ray constants might be somewhat different because you've got an oxygen atom in this, the fuels, but we still consider unimolecular decomposition, bed decision of the alkyl radical, addition of the alkyl radical to molecular oxygen, and the low temperature chemistry as you would for any alkane. It's, 
an, e an ether, but we still consider the low temperature chemistry in the way we would for uh, any alkane. Okay, and then we get the, the chain branching step. So we produce one, one ra fuel radical from dimethyl ether, and we get, end up getting the production of one, two, three reactive radicals in the chain branching process, as we would in an alkane. Okay, and we see negative temperature coefficient behavior for dimethyl ether, like we do for alkanes, because it's similar type of chemistry that occurs. We have um, the high degree of reactivity at low temperature due to the, the decomposition of the ketohydroperoxide species giving us the branching step. Then the negative temperature coefficient behavior due to the generation, in this case, of lots of formaldehyde. You see the formaldehyde increasing a lot in the negative temperature coefficient behavior. So the, the beta decision of the hydroperoxide radical, of this hydroperoxy alkyl radical giving us formaldehyde plus OH competes with the addition of this radical to molecular oxygen. And hence, we get the negative temperature coefficient behavior. And then the reactivity at high temperature is due to more high temperature kinetics and HO2 radical chemistry. OK, so that's alcohols and ethers, we we'll say, at high temperature. What about alcohols at low temperature? OK, so that's the high temperature. So that el molecular elimination reaction is important at high temperature. And that distinguishes the alcohols and the ethers from alkanes. Right? At low temperature, then uh, alcohols are being looked at. Okay? And isopentanol is a promising next generation fuel. Okay? At least it was back in 2010 and 2011. I think all these fuels from biomass now are being uh, reconsidered due to the cheap price of oil and so on. Okay, so efficient production routes of biomass exist, and isopentanol has a favorable characteristic as a homogeneous charge compression ignition fuel. So you can see here the, the intermediate temperature heat release rate for isopentanol is very similar to that of gasoline, and it's even better, or matches that of gasoline more closely than ethanol does. Okay, so it might be a better uh, replacement in terms of... Um, use it in a gasoline engine. OK, so, but low temperature in, in HCCI engines, they rely, it relies on auto ignition. And of course, the chemistry then uh, plays a central role. The low temperature chemistry plays a central role. And so we need to understand the low temperature chemistry then of biofuels if we're to understand these new technologies or develop them. OK, and this is just the, what we did in Go, we took some ignition delay measurements. Um, these are some data taken by uh, Jackie Sung's group at University of Connecticut. And these were some data uh, we took, I think, in Galway. Um, and also some high, high temperature ignition delay experiments in a shock tube. And you can see that by 0.5, 1, and 2, we see it's not really negative temperature coefficient behavior, but we so, do see some nonlinear behavior here where uh, the reactivity uh, decreases with temperature. But we're not seeing any NTC behavior. Okay? But the model captures the data quite well, except at the higher temperatures, sorry, the higher equivalence ratios where it's too slow at lower temperatures. Okay, so wh what's going on then? in the isopentanol chemistry. So we have isopentanol, if we have, uh, let, let's look at what would happen for isopentane. Is this one, two, three, four? The, sorry, isohexane. So this would be a similar type of molecule. We abstract a hydrogen atom uh, using OH. We get the radical. That radical adds to molecular oxygen. We get this radical, and then through a six-member transition state ring, we can abstract a primary hydrogen atom at the terminal carbon here, generating going from the RO2 to the QOH radical. And that QOH radical then can then either undergo a beta decision to give uh, this isobutyraldehyde plus ethylene plus OH, or add to molecular oxygen again and go on to chain branching. Okay? But if, let's, let's look at uh, isopentanol. That 
can undergo hydrogen atom abstraction by OH, generating this radical. That can add to molecular oxygen, generating the alkyl peroxy radical, and then undergo isomerization, producing this species. And so it's a hydroperoxy alkoxy radical. And this alkyl peroxy, al uh, hydroperoxy al alkoxy radical can then undergo by decision, okay, breaking this o CO bond, generating um, this species plus, uh, sorry, is this uh, isopro, I think this one, two, yeah, this is isobutyraldehyde. This is a C5 aldehyde plus HO2, okay? But you can see now, we've generated this radical in the, al in the alcohol species. And this radical cannot add to molecular oxygen, okay? This is an oxygen atom, and there is no well depth, right? It cannot recombine to give you uh, an alkyl peroxy radical. It won't stabilize. There's no well depth, okay? So this will not go on and react via chain branching. The only thing it can do is give you this propagation. And hence, these alcohols are going to be less reactive relative to alkanes because of the presence of that OH, okay? I focused on the H atom next to the OH group because at low temperature, Okay, or because of the bond association energy, again, this oxygen atom draws electron density away from the carbon here, and so the CH bond here is weaker than it would be, uh, than a secondary CH would be on an alkane. Okay, so the preferential site to abstract will be either here at this, on this carbon atom or here on the tertiary carbon atom in the molecule. Now, as I said, OH isn't that, um, uh, it's not that fussy about where it abstracts, but it does make some difference in terms of the rate of abstraction. Okay. What, what happened there? Okay, so I'm showing this again now in terms of activation energy. And if we look at the activation energy for this process here, we we calculate an activation energy for the similar process. Sorry, so here we have this process for the alkane. And if we calculate the, uh, this, this is, I'm looking at a different site now, which is the secondary one. We abstract a hydrogen atom, so we get this radical here, okay? So now, as I said in the last slide, this is the preferential site for abstraction. But even if we do abstract at this other site, Okay, now we get this alkyl peroxy radical, and via six-member transition state ring, we abstract this hydrogen atom. Again, we get this alkoxy radical, and we get these product species, isobutyraldehyde plus formaldehyde plus OH. But again, this cannot go on and add to molecular oxygen, giving you um, chain branching, okay? It can only give you a propagation. Okay, and this has a, an activation energy barrier for this transition state. It's a six-membered ring, but it's 22.2 kilocalories per mole. We calculated this in Galway at this level of theory. Okay, so this is just showing you the same thing again. Okay, but if you calculate this, so this is abstracting the hydrogen atom and the alcohol. But if you, and this ends up in a sort of dead end, with the propagation only. This cannot add to molecular oxygen. But if you look at the other side of the molecule, okay, and we abstract, we can go to one of these methyl groups on this side, either the CH on this side or this CH here, any one of these six hydrogen atoms. And again, we have a six-member transition state ring, one, two, three, four, five, six-membered ring, but using the same method and the same geometries and so on, starting out, we calculate an activation energy for this isomerization to be 24.4 kilocalories per mole, okay? So, and this then gives us, on this side of the molecule, again, we get this uh, hydroperoxy alkyl radical with the OH functional group at the other end, 
okay? And this can now go on and add to molecular oxygen, giving us chain branching. However, the activation energy calculated for this process is two catacalories per mole higher than it is to abstract the hydrogen atom on the alcohol group. And at low temperature, that two catacalories per mole is significant in terms of the ray constant. Okay? And hence, this isomerization will be faster than this one, even though it can happen also. Okay? And hence, again, why isopentanol will be slower to react than a corresponding alkane in size. So what we see for the alcohols is that the reactivity, their reactivity is typically lower in the low temperature regime than a corresponding alkane. Okay. What about, so that's alcohols. Okay. And they're, they're the relevant reactions that are important at low temperatures. Okay. So if we uh, look at large methyl esters, which are, this is a sort of an example of a large one, ethyl tetradecanoate, okay? So here's the ester functional group. We have a C double bond, O, O, and this is actually a, an ethyl ester. We have an ethyl group here, okay? If we look at this and we say, right, okay, let's try and look at the ester functional group, and this is a study we did in Galway where we looked at methyl butanoate and ethyl propanoate. So both of these have a C5 H10O2 molecular formula, but one is a methyl ester and the other an ethyl ester, okay? So if we compare the reactivity of both of them at the high temperature, okay? So again, uh, now similar to the high temperature work that we did on alcohols and ethers that I was talking about earlier, you see that the ethyl ester is always faster at the same condition of fuel and oxygen and so on. It's always faster to ignite compared to the methyl ester. And again, it's about a factor of two, okay? And this, regardless of whether you're at different pressures or different concentrations of O2, it's always faster. So the ethyl ester here is always the open symbol, the methyl ester, the solid symbol. So what's going on? If we look at the chemistry of methyl butanoate, methyl butanoate can undergo unimolecular decomposition, forming different radicals and smaller radicals, or can undergo H-atom abstraction. And so this is just looking at the flux analysis at 50% methyl butanoate consumed for this fraction at 1600 Kelvin. Okay? And you can see what's happening in the fuel. So H-atom abstraction is very important, but also some unimolecular decomposition. Okay? However, if we look at ethyl propanoate de decomposition at the, same, at the same edit, at the same condition, 50% fuel consumed and the same temperature and so on, what we see is that ethyl propanoate is decomposing via this six-member transition state ring, which is facile again, it has a low activation energy, producing propanoic acid and ethylene. Okay. And then, so our ethyl propanoate, this is almost exclusively, right? No, nothing else really is important. So really, if we have an ethyl ester, what we really have is like an acid and ethylene because it becomes an acid and an ethylene very quickly. And what did I say about ethylene earlier? Fast. It's very fast to ignite. And hence, um, the reactivity of ethyl esters are faster than methyl esters. Because an ethyl ester will always give you ethylene and a corresponding acid from the ester, okay, at this condition. Okay, so at high temperature, uh, low pressure, an ethyl ester will always give you the corresponding acid and ethylene. Okay, and then ethylene is quite fast, so it'll be relative relatively faster to ignite than a methyl ester. Okay. Now, the, you can consider methylbutanoate too, and there is a transition state ring here that is a six-membered ring. We did include it in the mechanism, and that will give you ethylene 
and this species here, which can then I summarize to give ethylene and methyl ethanoate. The species can give you this. But the ray constant for this wasn't competitive with the unit molecular decomposition and the H atom abstraction reaction. So the activation energy to this transition state was too high in comparison to the transition state involved here um, for in ethyl propanoate. Okay? Okay, so again, we, we have to consider low temperature reaction scheme then for these esters, okay? And we did for methyl butanoate, okay? And this is just showing you um, another slide of propane in air at 30 atmospheres. This is just an old mechanism compared to the data that we had at the time. And you can see that we do see negative temperature coefficient behavior for propane. Why am I taking propane? Because if we look at methyl butanoate, you can see here, look, we have CH3, CH2, CH2. So we have like an N-propyl group here on methyl butanoate, okay? And so you would expect then methyl butanoate to have reactivity similar to propane because it has that, that chain with this then ester group, C double bond O, O, CH3 next to it, all right? So it should behave, you'd expect, like um, propane. That's, that's, that would be a good guess going into the, into the problem. But actually, it doesn't, okay? So this is actually what methobutanoate reactivity looks like. This is for phi is equal to one at 10 atmospheres, okay? So, uh, this is at 30 atmospheres, slightly higher. But you see here, we're not seeing any reactivity below about 800 Kelvin. And the ignition delay times here are about 50 milliseconds, okay? And it, it's just decaying away. Um, this is not log scale, so it's, it would be linear on a log scale plot, okay? Now, so no NTC behavior is observed for methylbutanoate, even though we do see it for propane, right? And I'd like to actually compare, maybe not to N, N um, or to propane, but to compare to N-butane, as they have a common equivalence ratio. So for C5H10O2, you have to react with 6.5O2 to get the stoichiometric coefficient right, okay? And it's the same for N-butane then, okay? So let's just compare the two. So we have some data on M-butane, and M-butane shows the characters at the same condition, phi is equal to one and 10 atmospheres, and butane shows the characteristic negative temperature coefficient behavior, okay? So you can see actually here in the NTC region, because we're not getting the decrease in reactivity due to the, the propagation versus branching, and that low temperature chemistry dominating things, that Methobutanoate is faster than M-butane at, at this temperature, and actually at all these temperatures here, which is uh, strange. But it's not showing any NTC behavior, and it's quite a bit different in reactivity to the alkane, okay? So these esters are different from the alkane. So, uh, what's happening? Okay, and I, I'm actually missing some slides on this. And, and the answer is, actually, the com as a community, we don't know. Okay, we actually haven't definitively worked out why it is. Okay, but I can come up with some guesses. So here's our, our molecule, okay? And if we, and as I said, if you think of propane, here's propane. So we, this part of the molecule should behave like propane would, okay? But if we abstract the, the most easily abstractable, abstractable,
H atom, we get this radical. Okay? And now, if we add this radical, this radical adds to molecular oxygen, we will get this species. And I, I, I can't tell whether somebody's done these ab initio calculations or not. Um, but you can see now that this radical, when it adds to molecular oxygen, we've got this, it's next to a carbon, which is a C double bond O, o structure. And it's probable that that, bond, that well depth, when we go, sorry, I shouldn't do that. When we go from RO2, Sorry. When we go from R plus O2, we get ex chemically excited RO2, and we stabilize to stable RO2, that this well depth is quite shallow because the COO bond will be weak because it's, this carbon is bonded to this ester functional group. That will help weaken that. And if that's weakened, then this cannot stabilize to uh, isomerize via the six-member primary ring and go on to chain branching. Okay? And I think that's a large part of the reason that methylbutanoate doesn't show any low temperature chemistry and the, doesn't have any NTC behavior and low temperature reactivity. Okay? Because it just doesn't, it doesn't stabilize that RO2 radical. Also, then, some other bonds may be weaker due to the presence of this C double bond OO. And this radical, the radical formed here won't be long enough lived to go on and add to molecular oxygen. Okay? So there, there are two things. Another thing I, I'd like to point out, and this, this is a, a slide taken from Charlie Westbrook. He, did, he developed mechanisms for all of these different uh, methyl esters. So methyl esters are formed when you have a triglyceride reacts with three portions of methanol, forming the methyl ester, ester and glycerol. Okay? And it just depends on this um, alkyl functional group. Okay? So actually from nature, there's five different methyl esters that can be formed. Um, Methyl palmitate, methyl stearate, methyl oleate, linoleate, and linolinate. Okay, I can't. <laughs> uh, best of luck pronouncing them all. <laughs> um, but what I want to point out is that look, this one is just a straight chained N alkane with the ester functional group. And also, this is C16, C18. This one has one double bond in the structure. And then methyl, this one has two, and this one has three. Okay? And if we then predict the reactivities of these esters, what we find is that the two that have the straight chain are very fast. So these two here, the C16 and the C18, an alkyl functional group, are very fast. And then of intermediate reactivity here is the one with one double bond in it, and then the one with two double bonds is even less reactive, and the one with three double bonds is even less reactive again. And why is that? Don't look on in your notes. Can anyone speculate as to why that would be? Allylic radicals. So you answer correctly, allylic radicals. So again, if we have an allylic site, he sorry, an allylic site here, we abstract the hydrogen atom, and now we add, try to add that radical to molecular oxygen. Our well depth is going to be much shallower than it would be in an alkane. Again, it's 20 to 22. And if you've got a super allylic, as in here, it's even worse. Okay, the dwell depth is even shallower, maybe 15, 16. Okay, so therefore you don't stabilize RO2 very much. And the, hence, 
you don't get as much low temperature reactivity. Okay? So that's what's included here. It's the same slide as I showed you yesterday. Um, you've got the vinylic carbon atoms and then the allylic hydrogen, or carbon atoms with the hydrogen atoms on them. If you abstract the allylic, which are the easiest ones to abstract, then you get the allylic radical, but then your well depth for stabilizing the allyl peroxy radical is very shallow relative to an alkane. Okay, and I, of course then I, I, I spoke about the super allylic. Okay, and that's it. That's the, my last slide. Okay, I hope that I was able to teach some things. If you have any questions for me and you want to ask, I can talk now or we can uh, communicate via email. Okay, thanks guys. <laughs>